Please carry on everybody. Grab a seat, please, please. Hi, thanks so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hey everybody. <laughs> you can say hey, sir, that's fine. Hey, hey, hey. hey um, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, this is the third one of these I've done and uh, I want to keep them going. Uh, th this one's going to be a little bit different uh, because I actually have a lot of stuff I want to put out. I have note cards here so you're going to have to just bear with me as I read to you a little bit. Uh, but there's an awful lot going on and I want to be able to, in addition to making some announcements, I want to be able to spend some time talking with you about the budget reality that we're facing because I know it's on everybody's mind, not just from a communications perspective, our job to explain this to folks, but also because it affects our lives every day and it's going to definitely affect the lives of our civilians. So uh, we'll get to all that stuff, but I, and I'll try to get through this quickly um, without rushing it so that we do have time for your questions. So again, just some uh, announcements. None of them are not necessarily related, but the things I want to make sure I get out there. Number one, we stood up a new director at InchInfo, OI7, Afloat Media Systems, and that'll be headed by Janet Quigley. You all know Janet, um, a real pro, been, uh, been on the team for a long, long time. I remember first working with, with Janet at, uh, when I was at All Hands Magazine, and uh, she was on the TV show. So Janet, thanks very much for doing this. We're real happy to have you on the team, but new ACI, OI7, uh, the same work, the same focus on making sure that our our ships and sailors keep informed out there at sea. Um, all the same responsibilities, but now inside the, uh, the Chinfo umbrella. I think it's the right thing to do efficiency-wise, uh, and I'm just really happy to, to have you uh, back on board. So thanks very much. Um, very soon, I'm going to release a PAO career continu continuum. Now, this is for the active duty side, and so I want to be very clear about that. It's for, it's for, the, it's for the 1650s. Um, and it's, uh, it's something that, and I can't take credit for this, it really, the effort started, Bruce uh, and, uh, and Denny really started this work. Um, and I was uh, only too happy to inherit that and, and, uh, and, and be able to publish it. But uh, I really believe, as Denny did, that it is important for us to provide the 1650 community some structure um, and to be able to help them plan their lives and their careers across the continuum. And that continuum doesn't just mean that, you know, that, that, it's, that it's jobs and wickets you gotta hit. I'm not interested in checking blocks, and we've talked about that before, but it does include opportunities for education um, and even a little bit of, you know, getting out of, the, getting out of the, uh, the lifelines of PA every now and then. So I think you'll find this very interesting. I, I'm, uh, I've sent it out to the 06s. We're getting some feedback from them, but I, I think we're about ready to push send on this thing. And, We'll send it out there. Clearly, I want to value the feedback. It doesn't have to be just from the 1650s either. When you see this thing, if you have ideas, it's not etched in stone. We can always amend and modify and change it. In fact, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to have a plan that we can deviate from if we need to. And I also, just to hit that point again about checking blocks, that is not what this is intended to be. So when you look out there and you'll see, OK, at the 06 level, maybe I should be looking at COCOMs or uh, you know, or, or numbered fleet jobs, or maybe the senior course at the War College. Where those are ideas, those are potential opportunities. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do all those things in that order. And I'm living proof that that's the case. I mean, I bounced around all kinds of different ways, and I never had a COCOM job. And this is my first job at Chinfo. So, I mean, it, it, it doesn't, there isn't a set pattern here. We need some flexibility in the community to manage ourselves. But it does provide a structure. It does provide a planning tool, a way for you to kind of look at your future. And that's the idea. Uh, we're going to try something new, speaking of career continuum and, um, and opportunities. We're going to try something new for carrier PAOs. Uh, and this is a real hat tip to John Perkins up at the War College. I'm not going to take credit for it. When I was up there a few months ago, um, he said, hey, you know, uh, the Supply Corps has a great department head school f uh, that they put their uh, officers through before they go to carriers. Um, and uh, you might want to look at that. It's very, very good, very thorough. And so we did. And I talked to uh, Rear Admiral Heinrich, the Chief Supply Corps Officer in the Navy, great guy. And I told him I was interested in maybe sending PAOs there instead of the course that we had been sending them to. He couldn't have been more supportive. And so 
Our first uh, carrier PAO, future carrier PAO is going to go there, Jennifer Craig. She reports to the Lincoln this summer to relieve Steve Curry, and we're going to get her up there to that Supply Corps Department head school, and uh, hopefully she'll have some good feedback for us on how well it went and whether it was, it was worth the effort. I think she'll find it is, because um, the, 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 the Supply Corps takes very seriously their department head responsibilities on uh, carriers, as do we, and I think it's going to be very valuable. So I'm real proud and happy that we're able to do that. And again, hat tip to John Perkins. So when you give me ideas, be careful what you tell me, because I actually might do it. Uh, but, and I, and I was, no, I was really, and I, I, I had a chance to, uh, I was up at War College um, uh, Thursday, giving the graduation speech. Can, if, I don't know if you guys can believe it, but Ryan Perry actually did get his degree. Um, <laughs> I used to think that the academic standards at the War College were high. But apparently, no, I'm, just, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. They are, I'm kidding. They are very, very high. But anyway, I had a chance um, to speak at the graduation. And while I was there, I pulled John aside and thanked him. Because if he hadn't brought this to my attention, it never would have come up. And so when you, when I'm, I'm dead serious when I tell you I want your ideas and your thoughts. Float them up, and, uh, and we'll take them seriously. Um, we do still have some manning challenges in the community, and I'm per primarily at the, uh, on the, with the MC on the enlisted side. But I want to give you a little bit of good news. Um, we are uh, now, we just got approved uh, an, a new Master Chief billet at NPACE West, which is something we've been wanting to do for a long time. So that means we'll go from four to five approved Master Chief billets, which is terrific. It's just more opportunity now for, uh, for our senior chiefs to look ahead and, and know that there's, uh, that there's even a, uh, a higher opportunity for them to excel and to lead. Now, that said, we have seven on the books right now. Uh, so we're over even the five now that we have. But I do think that with some retirements coming up and with, uh, with Master Chief Houlihan getting picked up to be the uh, command Master Chief, um, we're going to we'll get, I think, some flexibility here. So uh, f for all of you uh, chiefs and senior chiefs out there, stick with us because there are some opportunities and we're continuing to try to, to make that possible for you. Um, we've had tremendous uh, response on the Russ Egnor uh, Navy Media Awards program. Tremendous. 1,250 entries this year, which is up two and a half times from last year. Uh, it's just fantastic. So I think there's a lot of buzz out there and enthusiasm. We, of course, We've, uh, there's more categories, so there's more opportunities for entries, of course, but I, I do think that the, there's a good energy there. The judging is going on now. It started about two weeks ago, finishes up Friday, and I really want to hand it to the Chiefs Mess for owning this. I asked them, to, I didn't, I told them they're going to own it, and they have done it, and they've done it very, very well. Uh, the, the feedback I'm getting from Master Chief McMillan is they themselves are enthusiastic and energetic about this because they know it's their program, and that's the way it should be. So I'm real excited about it. Again, wrap, wraps up the judging Friday. Is that right, Master Chief? And, um, and then so we'll, we'll be able to get the results out here. How long do you think that process takes, Master Chief, to so process the results? Early in March. The first week of March we'll get it out. First week of March. Okay, great. So anyway, just terrific. I'm just so pleased and so grateful for the Chiefs Mess for the leadership that they've shown here. It's just been terrific. Now, I know the last time I talked to you, I promised you that one of the things that I would do over Christmas break was write down communication priorities, my priorities um, as the Chinfo moving forward into this year. And I told you that I would get them out to you right after the Christmas holidays, and here we are heading into March, and I don't have them yet. I actually did do it. Um, I actually sat down over the Christmas break and wrote it. It's about three pages, just like I promised you. But then when I came back, um, the reality of all the budget uncertainty really started to hit home. And I began to, I looked at what I wrote against what we were actually facing in, in terms of real significant uh, changes to the way the Navy's going to do business and the way we're going to talk about the way we do business. That um, I, I think they were a little divorced from reality. So I didn't put them out to you on purpose. And I think before I do anything like that, I, I, we need to get kind of through this a little bit more and find out where we're going in FY13 from a budgetary perspective before I try to lay out some sort of vision document for you. I just didn't want it to be completely divorced from reality. And as I looked at it, I thought it was. So I just owed you that update. I didn't forget my homework assignment. I did do it. It's just not quite ready for, uh, to turn into the teacher yet. Um, and so that brings me to the thing I want to talk about, spend most of the time talking about, and that's this budget uncertainty. Um, 
You know the Navy has been very vocal and very honest and transparent and very forward-leaning about the impacts, the combined impacts of having no spending bill for this year and then sequestration. On Friday, if there's no debt deal, sequestration will take effect. Um, and uh, you can go online if you haven't already. You can see all the, we've been very open. All the slides are out there. Read them for yourself, all the impacts. Um, it, it'll take effect uh, March 1st. I suspect that you'll see communication from the department, from the secretariat level on down, about what specific decisions are going to get made and along what kind of a time frame they'll be made. And uh, I also expect that that kind of communication will continue throughout the spring. The CNO is very committed to not making decisions before their time. So there are some things, for instance, some maintenance availabilities, which aren't supposed to happen until well, well into the year. There's no reason to cancel them now on March 1st, um, but there will be some that have to get canceled. There'll be some work that'll have to get deferred, some things that we won't be able to do anymore. But to the degree he can preserve some of his own decision flexibility, he's going to do that. And so is Secretary Mabus, and I think that's exactly the right course. So uh, the challenge for us as communicators is that we need to stay abreast of all those decisions as they're being made, more importantly, the ones that aren't being made, and communicate and find ways to talk to our own people about that. We've been pretty active at Chinfo in pushing that stuff out to the community. Um, and I'm, and if, certainly if there's feedback on how we're doing, I'd be welcome, uh, welcome to hear it. Um, but I think we've done a pretty good job of that. We're going to continue to do that. We're going to push stuff to the community uh, as fast as we can and as, as, as efficiently as we can. Uh, but we need the community. We need the rest of the community all across the Navy to share some of that load in communicating. Um, it can't just be Secretary Mabus and the CNO that are out there talking, and both of them have been. Uh, we do need the fleet commanders, we need the type commanders, the numbered fleet commanders, installation commanders. We need them all out there, COs all the way down to the CO level, and we've been pushing ca captain's call kit material for that very purpose. So uh, for those of you here, and for those of you that are listening to me online, uh, please feel free to use the material we're giving you and get your bosses out there. They, they need to start talking, uh, not, and, and some of them are. I'm not trying to impugn all of them, but some of them are. But we need everybody out there talking and, and, and communicating with their people and with their families about what the impacts are going to be. They're not insignificant, these impacts. Um, there's been, uh, you know, there's been, I'll just say it now. I mean, you're going to see tomorrow anyway. I've written an op-ed piece for the Virginia pilot that will appear tomorrow. There's been this narrative out there that the, the Navy's been blustering on this, kind of or bluffing on this, that, uh, that, we've, that we've been stomping our foot for political purposes or to create drama. I can tell you nothing is further from the truth. I spent uh, a good chunk of time this weekend talking to the CNO about these very issues, and he's deeply concerned about uh, the very real impacts that, uh, that these cuts are going to have on the ability of the Navy to do its job. Now, as I said before, he and the secretary are committed to trying to do whatever they can in this fiscal year um, to keep the Navy flush, um, and they'll do that. And I suspect you'll see uh, the movement um, and decisions being made and then maybe remade as we try to figure out in fiscal year 13 how to keep forward deployed readiness high. But when you get into 14 and 15, it gets a little bit more difficult, and so we just all need to you know, be, be aware of that. It is very dynamic. Those slides, you've, the first set of slides we put out on January 25th, we just put out another set last week, I think it was, Chris, right, last week, uh, updating those numbers because the, the decision-making process is very dynamic. It's going to change again. I can guarantee it. And, I, and like I said, you have our commitment to keep you informed. Um, what's it going to mean for us in a practical sense? Well, you've already seen an impact uh, on travel, for instance. Um, my travel has been cut back, and I suspect everybody else's travel has been cut back. I know it's affecting NAVCO, it's affecting NPACE, it's affecting our I seamen uh, and afloat media systems, because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of work that needs to get done outside that, uh, and some of it's not getting done, because you're not able to travel. Now, we're going to preserve mission essential travel as much as possible, but defining mission essential is a pretty tricky thing sometimes. So travel's going to get hit. Conferences, you've already heard, I've, I'm sure you know, I've canceled the conference that we were going to hold in the spring, didn't want to do it, was looking forward to that uh, greatly, but 
I don't see how we can do it uh, and, and justify it. Uh, so, and it's across the board, Navy's, uh, the Navy's taking a hard, hard look at conferences and those kinds of things. Um, and then, of course, there's the furlough issue, uh, which I know is, uh, is gonna be an impact to all of us. I wanna stress that uh, no decisions have been made on furloughs right now. Um, if sequestration occurs, then I suspect furlough planning will accelerate. Uh, we have told Congress that we, do pl are, we are doing planning for furloughs, uh, but we've preserved the flexibility that, they, that the decision hasn't been made yet. And then um, for the, if, furlough, if furloughs uh, take place, of course, uh, our, the, our civilian employees will be notified by a letter that they're furloughed. That furlough will, be, will occur between the middle of April and the middle of October. Uh, basically, uh, one day a week, you, you won't be allowed to come to work. Uh, it'll be left up to commanders to determine uh, how those furloughs are managed inside their command. So nobody's going to dictate to a base CO, you know, what days each, what civilians are coming to work or not. That's going to be up to commanders to do that. For the Chinfo staff, it'll be up to me to do that, and we'll work our way through that um, to try to preserve as much readiness as we can with uh, you know, a workforce that's not going to be here one day a week and how we're going to do that. Uh, I don't know the specific answers for Chinfo yet, but we are working on that. I know this is causing great angst and uncertainty. It's causing great angst and uncertainty to me too because I think you all would agree with me, and this goes across the community, we couldn't do it without our civilians. It's, a, it, it's just, it's going to be incredibly painful. Uh, and I, I wish I had better news, but that's really where we're at. I can tell you this, I'll keep you as informed as I can as things, as things happen and as decisions get made. Um, the nice thing about being at Chinfo is we are, you know, we're, we're sort of the fulcrum of information here in the Navy Department, so we'll, we'll get news quickly and we'll be able to share it just as quickly as, as we can. And again, for those of you that are, aren't here and you're listening to me out there, the same thing, we'll push, you, we'll push you everything we've got on this so that you can communicate and your bosses can communicate with your civilians. Uh, I kind of got ahead of my cards here, didn't I? Outreach, that's the other thing that's gonna affect us, outreach. Um, in about an hour, I'm gonna be meeting with the CNO and uh, I've asked for the meeting so that I could walk him through the logic uh, that I wanna pursue with respect to uh, Navy outreach for fiscal year 13. Um, we had a very robust Navy week and 50-50 pro, uh, program all set up. Um, we even had flag officers assigned uh, to various cities and to all the Navy weeks. Uh, we, I mean, it was, uh, Kim Marks had done and, and, and Rob Noel had done a great job laying it all out uh, when, the, when this hit. And we had it all kind of, right after the holidays, it was set and then this this reality set down on us. And so what I'm gonna tell the CNO is, I wanna preserve as much as I can, same way he wants to preserve maintenance for ships and aircraft, I wanna preserve outreach. So I don't wanna make any decision before it's time. I'm not gonna just say on Friday, all outreach is getting canceled. Uh, I wanna preserve the flexibility to do Navy weeks in 50-50s, maybe later on in the year if we can, you know, if the money um, is available. On the other hand, I gotta, I'm, I'm, I'm past the point, actually, in making some very significant decisions right now. There's a few Navy weeks um, that are very close. The first one's in March, uh, Savannah and in Tampa, um, and uh, I don't think we're gonna be able to do those, but that's why I'm meeting with the CNO. I wanna walk him through that logic. One of the main points I'm gonna make to him is that aside from preserving flexibility and canceling stuff, I still wanna do outreach, and I think it can still be done under these fiscal constraints. We just have to be smart about it. So we won't do Navy weeks, but we can still do outreach in those same cities, maybe using reserves, uh, our reservists that live there. Um, it could be virtual outreach as well. We have a lot of flag officers that, um, that uh, did 50-50 visits uh, last year. They've got these great relationships and some of them are their hometowns, others are just towns they visited. No reason why they can't get on the phone and do interviews or, uh, you know, or stay in touch, write letters. I mean, there's a way we can, we can do virtual outreach as well, but we are looking at scaled down physical present outreach in some of those same cities we had Navy Weeks. We're just not gonna call them Navy Weeks because we really aren't. They, don't, they won't 
really meet the same requirements of a Navy week. Uh, the fleet is getting ready, I think, to make some big decisions about their participation in fleet weeks and in Navy weeks as well. Port visits, I don't want to speak for Admiral Gortney because I don't think these decisions have been made yet, but it's very possible that um, most, if not all, CONUS port visits will get canceled. Um, you know the Blue Angels are certainly uh, under threat right now. That it's, it's, uh, no decision's been made there yet either, but it's certainly possible that their flight schedule for this year will get canceled. The Thunderbirds will follow suit. Air demos and flyovers, all that will, will come under greater scrutiny. OSD has put out some guidance. Have they put it out yet, uh, Rob, or is it? Not out yet, but it's going to come out soon. Gu guidance that we actually help them write uh, that will sort of lay this out um, sort of at, a, at an umbrella, a strategic level. Same idea that I just told you, that we're going to try to preserve as much as we can. Um, thematically, it'll be more aligned towards wounded warrior and veteran reintegration into the communities around the country. That's going to kind of be the theme um, that's a very legitimate reason to continue outreach. So. So the, it won't just be that our participation will change, but the context and the character of it will change a little bit too. We'll keep you posted on this. I'll let you know how the meeting with the CNO goes, um, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll get guidance from him, and then we'll, we'll press on. Uh, we talked about that. I want to talk about family support a little bit. Um, the CNO has been very, very clear that to the maximum extent he can, with everything in his power, he's going to preserve family support programs and initiatives. Uh, and he's deadly serious about it, I can tell you that for sure. Um, and, and we're going to do that. But you know there's probably going to be some impacts. Um, for instance, if there is a furlough, a lot of our child care, uh, child development center workers are Navy civilians. Um, uh, so there may be an impact there. The commissaries, as you know, they're looking at maybe shutting down uh, one day a week. I think here in the D.C. area, they're looking at maybe shutting down on Wednesdays because it's their slowest day. So every Wednesday, you know, it'll, it'll be closed. So, I mean, there's going to be some decrement in the benefits. But I can promise you that, uh, that we're just as committed to keeping these family support programs in place as we can. Um, TRICARE is another issue that the chiefs are very, very concerned about and have expressed those, those concerns. Um, uh, you heard Deputy Secretary Carter, uh, you may have heard him testify uh, to this a couple of weeks ago, that, um, that there's potential hits to, to the TRICARE program coming later in the year. Nothing firm yet, but uh, it's difficult to predict exactly how that's going to affect. You're still going to get you're, you're still going to get the quality of health care that you have earned and the dental care and all that and your dependents as well, but it may be longer waits, uh, that kind of thing. So it's harder, maybe a little harder to get uh, appointments. But again, we'll keep you informed as much as, uh, as, much as we can. Uh, okay, and this gets me to just to the last point here. Um, and I kind of already hit this. Um, the speech I gave up in Newport, um, and if you haven't read it, I, I'd ask you to go ahead and look at it, not because I think it's this wonderfully eloquent Gettysburg Address-like speech, but, but, it, but it does summarize for, for me the crux, and, and it gets right to this budget problem we're having, of, of what our responsibilities are, not just as communicators, but as members of the military and of the Navy, all of us. And I told the grads, one, I think we need to do a better job of relating to the people we defend. I, 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 get, I worry that, and, it, and it's not so much for us, because I think, I think we do a great job here in the Navy public affairs community, but I do worry that we talk at people instead of talking with them. You've heard me say that but they want access to conversation, not information. Uh, and so I, I, I urge the graduates to think about the way they think about the people they defend. And, um, you know, you always hear a lot of hand-wringing, well, the American people don't know us, they've forgotten about us, they don't appreciate us. And I just frankly don't buy that argument. I think they do support us. They do know us. Uh, and, they, and they want to be there for us. Now, do they know everything we do? No. Because as I told the graduates, they're pretty distracted on their own right now. You know, we're facing some significant budget issues. We're wrestling with them. They've been wrestling with them for a long time as well. I guarantee you, I raise your hand if you know somebody, family, friend, or otherwise, who's either lost their job, lost a home, lost a car, having trouble making payments. Yeah, look at all those hands. 
Me too, in my own family. Um, it's serious. Uh, and they've, they've got real issues at home to worry about. And it's kind of nice that they don't worry about us. It means they trust us. You know, they don't need to be thinking every minute about the capabilities of the United States Navy because they know we got it. They know we have a big job to do, and they appreciate that. And that was one of the points I made to them. The other one was, I think I told them, uh, we got to understand the world of politics a little bit better. I'm not saying that we, you know, as I said, don't declare openly for a party. You know how I feel about being apolitical and keeping your political opinions to yourself, particularly those of us in this business. But we do have to understand the business of politics. It, it's, not, it's not good enough to just say, well, oh, that's, that's them. That's not me. And, you know, they're wrong and we're not. It, you, you have to understand that business and uh, the difficult task of governing. And, yes, I know it's partisanship is bitter in town. It's, it's perhaps more bitter than I've ever seen it in Washington. And I've been here consecutively since, you know, 2005. But even before that, I had a couple of tours in D.C. I, it, is, it is bitter right now. And I can't explain it, and frankly, it's not my job to do that, and I wouldn't even want to try. But we have to understand it, and we have to realize that they, politicians, whether they are, uh, they are political appointees above us in the executive branch or they're elected officials on the Hill, um, they are every bit as patriotic as we are. They believe in this country every bit as much as we do. They have perhaps a different view. That's okay. That's the business of democracy, and I just wanted us to, I, I wanted the the students to understand that, that, not to treat it as if it's something different and apart. It's not. Uh, and then the last point, which I don't need to tell you, is that I, 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 um, I talked about my views on strategic communications and, and the fact that communication is a two-way street. It always has been since caveman days. And, and that, that has never changed. I mean, all the social media in the world and technology, the speed with which information travels, doesn't change the fact the people still need to talk to people and listen. And that was my main point. Listen and let go of a little bit of control. And so back to what I said before, we all have a responsibility, uh, especially in times that are uncertain, like right now, to communicate, to talk to one another and to our people and your commands people and their families. If ever there was a time uh, where communication was critical, it's now. I mean, it always has been, but it's really critical right now. Uh, and it's really critical that we join that conversation, that we look for opportunities to insert ourselves. And when you see something that's wrong, factually or thematically, jump in. Fix it. Correct the record. Don't be afraid of that. As I said, you're going to see an op-ed piece from me tomorrow on the Virginia Pilot because I've seen a, a tone and coverage that I don't like and, frankly, is wrong. So I'm pushing back. My expectation is you'll do the same thing. Okay, I'm going to shut up now and take whatever questions we might have. Kate. Hey, I just wanted to bring this up as soon as I could because what you were talking at the end there about the, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, this is being recorded, so you have to be. Okay, so I just wanted to bring up that, the fact that um, what you were saying at the end about our attitudes and how we think about the other people in American society. I was disturbed by the Navy Times or Military Times publishing big headline today when I, I just mm. struck the cover story. It says, you know, troops to Obama, don't mess up our military. Yeah. And my first gut reaction was, it's not our military, it's all, it's societies, it's American it's society's military. military. And so exactly that attitude right. is something we have to also listen for and, and correct when we hear it and see it. I, I completely agree. I mean, there's a, uh, here, I'll take that for you. I'll just hand it to the next person. I, um, I completely agree. I, I, uh, I, I didn't go this far in my speech the other day, although I had wanted to. Uh, but, I mean, and, and Gates talked about this before he retired, that, that sometimes, and in some places in the military, there grows an attitude that we are somehow superior to the society that we defend. I... What I said to the grads was, you know, we aren't different from Americans. We, we come from them. We are citizens, too. We come from them. And we're all going to go back into American society. We're all going to end up getting out. Someday we're going to hang up the uniform. Um, and we have to remember that. We aren't. And if we start to believe that we are somehow separate and apart and better than, and that's even worse, separate and apart is bad enough, better than, then we're in a dangerous place um, 
in, in this republic, and I really worry about that. So it's a great point. I, saw, I had the same reaction when I saw the cover this morning. It's not a good place for us to be. And I think Kate's right. To the degree we see that, feel it, hear it, push back on it. You have an obligation to do that. You've read all my 13 rules. Rule number two is be skeptical. So be the person in the room that says, hey, wait a minute. This, is, this conversation's going a bad way. You need to turn it around. Good point. Who's next? Yeah, Danny. Can you give us a Wait, you gotta, I gotta give you the mic, Danny. Hi, oh, sir. <laughs> couple more lines on OI7. Why do I need to call them? Just a little bit deeper on what they are going to do or what their mission They're, is. Or, is it technical? Is it a float you know, media PAD system? notes? What is it? Yeah, a float media systems. The job stays the same. The installation, the repair, the modernization, the and the procurement of systems for a float commands to help them communicate. Uh, it's, the, it's no different. Janet, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah. See, I nailed it. So that's... Were they part of DMA before? Or? Yeah, well, actually, you, it was NAVC. Isn't that right, Janet? Yes, you worked for NAVC before. Yeah, that was your claimancy. We came from Media. Oh, there's a microphone. We were with DMA, Defense Media Activity, and then as a result of the BRAC, we were seated over at NAVC, but we transferred from DMA off their roles and directly onto CHINFA's roles. So. That answer your question? You satisfied, Danny? All right, good. Sir, I have a Nate. question. Go ahead. Oh, there's one more. Nate. Hey, sir. A, a bit of a professional development question. You talked about your op-ed, and I'm curious to know why, why it's penned by you and not, say, somebody like CNO or the secretary or somebody like that. Why you chose personally to, to yeah. answer yourself. And number two, why you didn't choose a different paper? I mean, is it because of the fleet concentration area? Why didn't you use the post or anything? Good, more good questions. One, I did it because I take very seriously my role as the Navy spokesman. I mean, that's what they pay me to, to be, and I believe the, the Chinfo should be the spokesman. Uh, and um, this is an issue that is, it, I mean, could, could the CNO or the vice chief have penned it? Uh, yeah, they could have. One could argue that maybe Admiral Gortney could have penned it. But um, I believe it, to me, it, it got right to the, the character and our integrity when it comes to making decisions. It, it, it wasn't, the issue about Truman's, the, the, the op-ed piece, if you haven't read it, it's basically walking the reader through why Truman was delayed, that it wasn't an act of drama, and it certainly wasn't political pandering on the military uniform side. So um, I felt very strongly that we needed to push back on that argument, and I was very comfortable with me doing it as the Navy spokesman, speaking for all the flag officers, because there's, there's not one particular flag officer that was responsible for that decision. First of all, it was Secretary Panetta's decision based on advice that we gave him the uniform side, and Secretary Mavis as well. I just felt that there were so many people involved in this that it was probably better to have it crystallized coming from me. And again, I take, a, I, I take that responsibility very seriously about being a spokesman, and I tend to want to be more, uh, I tend to want to be active. Um, and why the pilot? Uh, uh, we had this discussion over the weekend, and I think. Um, there was a couple of things. First of all, it is sort of the paper of record for the United States Navy, if you think about it. Um, and it's, in the, it's the major newspaper in the biggest fleet concentration area. And uh, the Truman is there in Norfolk. Uh, and uh, I just felt that it was appropriate. And I, I frankly, um, uh, I was a little concerned that if I placed it anywhere else, the placement itself could look political. You know what I mean? Like if I tried to get it in the post, I mean, that's a little ham-fisted, I think. I was writing as much for the Truman families and the sailors as I was the critics. And so I felt, again, it just made a lot of sense to go with the Virginia pilot. Does that make sense? Was this all gut, or was, who, were you talk, who were you talking to when you were making it? It was, uh, well, gut at first. I mean, I, I woke up Saturday morning and read uh, George Will's column. And I know George and like him very much. I have great respect for him. I called him uh, uh, and talked him through uh, the logic behind it. And he was very grateful and appreciative for the context. He didn't have that when he wrote. I don't think he necessarily, I mean, he's not going to change his opinion or his piece, and no, nor was I asking him to do that. Um, but I wanted him to know what it was like for us. 
And he asked me, and th this is what got me uh, at the, near the end of the conversation. And, I, you know, it's, I called him cold. I mean, I hadn't talked to him in probably over a year. And so um, he was very, very gracious to take the call cold. Didn't know I was going to make this call. But um, at, at near the end of it, he goes, well, you guys had to have known, you guys meaning the military leadership in the Navy, the uniform leaders, you had to have known how this was going to get perceived, that you guys were going to be perceived as being political and trying to ram this um, down on, on Congress. And I said, George, I don't know that, I don't know that, we, that we would have. I don't think that's true. I don't think we, we, knew, we knew that or that we would have predicted that that would have been the way it would have come across. And so when I hung up with him, Man, that little exchange was just in my brain, and I thought, well, I, I got to do something about this. And uh, so I, I talked to the CNO on Saturday morning. Um, he had not seen the piece by then, but had heard about it and had similar concerns. Um, and I told him what I was thinking, um, and he agreed that it was worth a shot. So, based on that conversation and and what was already in my brain, I went ahead and just we we just put some pen to paper. I mean, uh, and that's what we came up with. Um, we worked it yesterday um, with, uh, with the CNO, uh, who had some very, very good suggestions and changes to it, and also with the Secretariat, uh, Secretary Mav Mavis' staff as well. And, and I showed it to George, of course, uh, because I do mention Secretary Panetta in there. I thought it was important for George to see it and understand it, and to know where and when it was going to run. I mean, the, the president's going to uh, Newport News tomorrow, so you know it, I didn't want anybody surprised that this was going to be in there. Not, not that it's going to cause a, a problem in that regard, but so we socialized it yesterday, and then that's where we are right now. Is that, is yeah, that answer? And one additional point: Could you talk about just the need for speed now? In the old days, you get an op-ed somewhere; it could be a week-long process and running all the vetting and all that other kind of stuff. Yeah, it was very important to to me that we we. You know, once I had seen the piece Saturday and I had the conversation with George, I knew time was of the essence because you're right. If, I mean, everything is the speed of heat these days. And if you don't, um, if you see something wrong or an idea that you want to correct, you, you got to do it then. You know, I, I'd rather have an 80% sort of solution and pushing back on something or clarifying something than 100% a week or 10 days from now when it's irrelevant. The... Um, the, the window for making this case is very small because as we get longer in the week, the issue is not going to be whether the Navy was being political or not. It's going to be the actual, no kidding, March 1st, here they come. You know what I mean? Um, so the window was very, very, in my view, I wanted it today, uh, but the pilot doesn't do op-ed pieces on Monday. They don't have an op-ed page on Monday. And we didn't get it to them until yesterday afternoon, right, Chris? So. Um, it, it wouldn't have been, probably wouldn't have, even if they had an op-ed page, we probably wouldn't have got in today. But I wanted it today. I wasn't trying to be too cute and putting it in Tuesday because, because of the president's visit. I wanted it now. Because the only, you know, it's the attention span, right? Right now, because of that piece on Saturday, this idea that the Navy's being political is fresh and it's out there. And it's picking, it had been picking up steam all week. So you got to, if you're going to kill something, or at least try to kill it, you got to do it when it matters. You, you can't wait. Because then, if I, if I were to do this later in the week, first of all, I don't think anybody would run it. And even if they did, it would just be lost in the clutter. Nobody's going to pay attention. So you, you got to be fast. I had um, a couple of guys from Al Jazeera come in uh, to see me the other, the other day last week. These are guys, I've, you remember Jeremy Young and Josh Rushing. You know, we, we worked a lot with them on, this, on the joint staff. And um, good catch up with them. And uh, Josh asked me, uh, just out of the blue, he goes, so how has social media changed? How's it changed your life as a spokesman? What does it make different? And the one word answer I gave him was speed. Um, and you know, so when you, even when you do an op-ed piece and it's going to run in a daily newspaper, th there's still a social component to this. You know, because it'll, hopefully, it'll make the rounds in social media and it'll get around. Um, but it's speed. Everything today is about speed. And, and, and I think even without social media, we'd be dealing with significant speed issues. Uh, but it just makes it that much faster. And if you're not up to, sp up to step, if you're not willing to engage, and sometimes doing it without permission. I mean, if you think it's the right thing to do and your gut tells you, do it. And then, you know, if you have to ask for forgiveness later, ask for forgiveness later. But, but we, we have to be faster. Uh, we can't, you can't over, you, you can't overstaff stuff. You just become irrelevant. And I asked him, how has it changed your life as a reporter? He says, it's changed everything. 
Uh, and he gave a great example. Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, you may have followed the protest activity in Cairo. But they were, the, the story had begun to emerge that small groups of young men, thugs, were targeting uh, women who were coming out to Tahir Square to protest. And in a very organized, ugly way, carting these women off the square and, and raping them and assaulting them. Uh, and they were even so sophisticated that they had hand signals. And I mean, they, I mean it, was, it was a team approach here. It was just ghastly. And he said, thanks to social media and, and witnesses tweeting, hey, I just saw a group take a young woman down this alley to this corner behind that building. Um, law enforcement was able to, by following Twitter, get to the scene and, so, and break some of these up before they happened. But it also allowed the media to get there as well. And they believe the combined effect of media attention at the site of the crime, before the crime has taken place, combined with law enforcement presence, all thanks to social media, um, has helped to reduce the occurrences. Now, I think it's still a problem over there, but it's, there, there sure, sure seems to be some deterrent effect. So it's changing everything. It's, it's immediate. Everything is immediate. Yeah. Uh, well, there are approximately 190 participants from across the fr uh, fr Fantastic. From WebEx. Um, there's several questions that have come in uh, regarding reserves. Um, how is the CR sequestration going to impact AT um, and the role of reservist? It will affect AT to the degree that, I mean, it, it, it and, I, and I wouldn't want to speak for Vic, but um, if, I, I think uh, AT will be okay, but there'll be a much sharper look on, on training opportunities in general for reserves. Um, uh, they'll have to be justified just like everything else we're doing. But because the reserves, you know, part, part of their very existence is to train. It is mission essential work. Uh, I suspect that they'll still be able to do that. But I wouldn't want to speak for each CO about the, the, the how, how they're going to manage that. Did that answer that? Okay. Yeah, Liz. So with our funding, travel is incorporated into the, the planning. And so at least right now our guidance is just continue, you know, obviously use the same discretion on planning things, but we don't have the same right. the same problems with the travel and things like yeah. that. So yeah, because our, it's essential to what you're doing. I mean our cutbacks are more like if the active duty quits an exercise or scales something down, then right. there isn't the opportunity to go do it. Right. But normal AT is what I'm saying. Right. You, that's essential to being a reservist, is to preserve those skills. So I don't expect that that'll, my, that, so basically I was right, right? I love it when I hear I'm right, good. All right. Sir, I have a question from uh, Lieutenant Commander Steve Curry from the Abraham Lincoln. He wants to know with the, uh, the budget issue, would you consider extending orders to four years or keeping PAOs in a local area longer? No. <laughs> um, no. I. Right now, we're not looking at changing tour lengths, and right now there are no. This is a good question because it gets to you know one people are thinking about uh, whether they're still going to get PCS orders. You are still going to get PCS orders this year. I can't predict what it's going to look like in 14 and 15, but we're not anticipating any mandatory adjustments to tour length uh, or cutbacks in PCS orders. Now again, uh, I'm not the chief of naval personnel, but. Uh, that's where we are now. We're still pressing on with all the moves that we have scheduled to do this year and planned to do this year, so your PRDs won't be affected. And I have no intention of, of artificially on my own uh, changing those PRDs. I mean, so much of we're a small community, um, and the, the daisy chains have got to keep going. So I want to try to keep as much stability and normalcy in PRDs as possible. But it's a great question, Steve. Great question. Commander Will Marks at the um, Naval Academy, he asks, the public seems to support at least some cuts to the defense budget. Why haven't we emphasized communication points advocating the authority to move money around from lower to higher priority items rather than just communication points for getting money back into the budget? Well, we actually have, Will. I mean, um, uh, if you go back and look at the testimony uh, that the Vice gave to the Senate and the CNO gave, uh, on the House side and, and frankly all defense leaders, that one of the things they have repeatedly talked about is the lack of flexibility under a continuing resolution to move money around. There's no what, they call, what we call transfer authority. Um, now, 
I want to be clear, and the CNO made this point to me yesterday when we chatted, that even with transfer authority, it's not going to solve every problem this fiscal year. Uh, but, but he has been very, very open uh, about wanting that authority, and, they, and, he's, and he's addressed this with, he and Secretary Mavis have addressed this with members on the Hill uh, in private meetings as well. So we have asked for that. We have talked about that. But we shouldn't oversell it. It, it will certainly ease uh, the strain on the operating and maintenance accounts this year, but it isn't going to alleviate all the problems we're going to face. Jeannie, did I get that right? Is that about? Right. Like you said, you have to be careful. But it's not going to solve everything, but it certainly would make it easier for us to, to move money from other accounts into the operating accounts so that we won't have to cancel all these availabilities and we won't have to cancel all these exercises and deployments. Um, but it does come if you take money from, say, your investment accounts and to put it in, if you, if you have that authority, Okay, so that's great. You can preserve some of your operational ability, but you, it comes at a cost to something in the future too. It's about trade-offs and it's about balance and understanding what the risks are. So you can take money from a program, uh, a future ship or a future aircraft or something like that. But it, you know, to, so that gets you readiness now, but you're end up, you're going to end up paying for it. You're buying into your future later, eating into your future later. Have anything else here in the room, sir? What's being communicated? Well, I mean, is there a heavy stress based on you know, what impact it's going to have on those two things? We've been very clear with uh, OSD and the leadership, Secretary Panetta, Deputy Secretary Carter, about the real readiness concerns we have in the Navy. I mean, you've seen those slides. Those slides have been shared with, uh, with the OSD staff. <clears throat> and as the, as the CNO made clear uh, again over the weekend with me, you know, it, it's important that people understand that the decisions that are being made, for instance, the Truman decision, all being done um, in collaboration and in coordination with the OSD staff. But I think we've been very open and honest with, uh, with OSD. And on the public affairs side, too. I was, you know, I um, talked to George a couple of times over the weekend. And um, you know, we're, I'm doing my best to keep him informed of everything, not only that we're doing, but what we're saying about what we're doing. So I think there's been a pretty good lash up there. I'm not aware of any, any holes in it. Um, I didn't get any pushback on the op-ed. George and I, I sent it to him, and, I, and we talked about it. Um, he agreed that it was a good thing to do, and didn't, he didn't have any changes. But, but on, the, on the, the communication side, I have been keeping George informed and the OSD uh, informed about what we're doing and how we're doing it and when we're going to say what. And uh, a point, one point to his question, obviously, OSD is putting out the data calls and asking the Navy to give them all the information. It's not just that we're pushing it. I mean, not from the... No, that's true. I mean, it's, we have requirements to provide... It's going data. both ways. It's, did that answer your question? Because I don't know if I specifically got at it. Yeah. Okay. What else? You got any out there? Lieutenant Mike Hatfield from NPACE asks on behalf of a contractor, for contractors whose contracts end at the end of this fiscal year, what will happen to them? Contractors, um, um, it's hard to talk about this in any kind of a blanket way. Um, those, uh, the contract work that we are currently under, that will continue. Uh, so, so contractors working under a valid contract continue that, you know, that we've already paid for, that's not gonna change. Um, but what the department has asked all commands to do is take a look at the renewal of those contracts. Do you really need to renew it? Do you need to renew it in a different way? Or does it, does it need to go away altogether? So contract work in general is getting scrutiny at the command level. Um, but I, you know, each command is going to handle this differently under the, the guidance of their senior leadership. But uh, contracts that are currently in effect will continue to be in effect. I got like five more minutes. That's what I'm being told anyway. Anybody else? Chris. Boss, can you uh, talk a little bit about all hands? Yes, thank you. Yeah, we brought all hands back. I think I, I sent a note out to the community on that. Um, 
and it's uh, up on up on the web ah.mil. Um, if you haven't checked it out, please do. Uh, again, I. I view, as I said all along, I view all hands as a dynamic, iterative uh, product. And so I expect it's going to continue to change. It's going to, uh, we're going to continue to improve it and make it better. It's all, it looks great. Uh, my goal is to make it practical, usable information for sailors and families and to be as immediate, back to your question on speed, it's another vehicle, I'm, I'm hoping, another vehicle that we all use for speed to get the word out there. Um, the Navy Times does a great job. Uh, sometimes I think they do too good a job, and I, I want to give them a little run for their money here. I think we can, and I think all hands can allow us to do that if we all use it. And that's the point. And we all have to be participating in this and feeding stuff to them in usable, digestible bits. Oftentimes, uh, when we describe a policy decision, it's in a Navy.mil story that is fairly difficult to get through. Uh, and we've got to find ways to make information more accessible to everybody. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, again, I give a lot of credit to Navy Times. They're able to do that. They can take, they can take a, a fairly, uh, what we would view a complicated or, or complex policy decision and break it down. And here's the top five things you need to know about it. We don't do that. We just lay it out there. We, you know, and we, we take the nav admin or we take an all nav or whatever the message traffic was that defined this thing and we rehash it into a, a Navy.mil story, that's not gonna be good enough anymore. We've got to get better at making information usable and digestible. Good question. Oh. <laughs> I'm being told to tell you that if I didn't get to your questions and you have any questions and you wanna send them to me separately, I will certainly follow up and get you the answers. I will do that, uh, I'm committed to that. Um, I'm gonna stop here. Thanks again for your time. It matters to me. I know everybody's busy, and I know there's a lot going on. I'm going to keep doing these. Um, uh, we'll, do the, we'll do another one in a couple of months as well. But I'm always available. It doesn't have to be in this forum. Um, you can always get to me uh, any number of ways, and I promise I'll get back to you with as best, uh, the best answer I can. Thanks for your time. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. You know, that